Welcome to Getting Sketchy Live, brought to you by TheVirtualInstructor.com. And now, let's get sketchy. Hello there, everyone. Matt here with TheVirtualInstructor.com, and welcome to the greatest live broadcast in all of YouTube. That, of course, would be Getting Sketchy Live, where either myself or my good friend and fellow artist and art teacher, Ashley Hurst, tries to create a drawing for you within 45 minutes. And tonight, I'm going to be doing the drawing, so I'm shaking. I'm nervous. <laughs> um, we're going to be continuing with the motif that I'm doing this season, which is facial features. And tonight, we're going to be drawing something that, that we all have, hopefully, all of us have, except for maybe Van Gogh, and that would be an ear. Um, Van Gogh, Van Gogh has he, an ear. He has, he has one he ear. He has one ear. Actually, he has one ear and about 10% of the other. I, <laughs> I, saw a, I saw a drawing one time. Well, it, this is... You know, I, I often think about, not often, but I've thought before about why Van Gogh might have cut his ear off, and I have a theory. Oh, the, the theory is soft, Matt. A what? diary was discovered about three years ago you, in a rummage sale in Europe by the doctor who saw Van Gogh and treated him for his cut ear. Yeah. And he wrote notes in there about why the ear was cut off, and he even did a drawing of the cut ear so you can see... He had half of his earlobe left. Yeah. That's what was. And uh, so what's your theory? Because I actually, this is, I mean, yeah, I'd like I, to share I don't want to digress. Because... We could talk about this for an hour because I have my own theories that were proven wrong. Uh -huh. um, and uh, so anyway, what's your theory, Matt? My theory is, my wife is always telling me that I never listen to her. So I figured Van Gogh <laughs> might have had the same problem and just decided to cut his ear off and give it to his girlfriend, right? He gave it to his girlfriend, That's right. right? That's right. Um, maybe so that Good when she woman. wanted to talk, he always, she always had he his ear. He was always there. Yeah. yeah. Always, is that not what happened? That is very close to what happened. He is did, it really? Well, pretty much. Yeah. You know, when I was a kid, and you might remember too, there was a cartoon that came on on Saturday mornings between the real cartoons. It was like... What do you mean a cartoon that came on between the real cartoons? It was like a commercial length cartoon. And it was a, like an art enrichment moment, something yeah. like that. You uh -huh. know, one of those public service announcements in the 80s in a cartoon form. The more form. you know. The more you know, do -do 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 -do. right. Right. So it was like that. So Van Gogh, it was about him, and he had cut his ear off and yeah. given it to a girl. You know, he, he, she opened the door, and gave him, he gave her a package, and she opened it. There was an ear in there, and she screamed, and that was the end of the cartoon. I'd love to find that cartoon. It's about 40, you know, about 35 or 40 years old. Yeah. So um, after that, I went to art school, and... You know, I, I would occasionally work with sharp tools and cut myself. And I thought, you know, Van Gogh probably <laughs> just had an, a legitimate practical accident. And this yeah. crazy, this crazy rumor got started. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's a wonderful painting by Jacob Lawrence. You know, Jacob Lawrence is of himself in his studio with a hobby knife on the floor and his hands bleeding. Jacob mm -hmm. Lawrence actually did a painting to commemorate himself cutting himself in the studio. And of course, um, Van Gogh was friends with Paul Gauguin. We all know they had a big, a big fist fight, an actual physical fight one time. So I figured that he cut his ear in the studio. It was legitimate, it was an accident, or maybe with Paul Gauguin. And this crazy story got started about him yeah. giving it to a girl he liked just so he would seem, you know, less stable. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, um, he did give it to a girl that he liked because the doctor that treated him wrote that in his diary. Yeah. So you, the cartoon was right and Matt's right. And my theory of, uh, of, uh, of a practical accident, not, not true. It's always the wilder story that is but, uh, more, more, less believable, but more likely to be true. Now, I, I totally made that up because, you know, I, I now, don't know, but I, I could see that. It may not have been because she said he didn't listen to her. Right. We, we can't verify that. Right. Well, you know, you, he, she'll always have his ear. He was giving her a piece of himself, though. I mean, right. something meaningful, something important. Right. Well, better to give uh, a piece of your ear than to give her a piece of his mind, I guess. Uh, yeah. Because that would have involved a lot more cutting. <laughs> um, anyway... Um, we well, we couldn't, a, we, we couldn't, a time that's here. okay. We couldn't do a drawing of an ear without talking about Vincent Van Gogh's right, ear absolutely. for at least five minutes. So at least we got that out of the way and we can move on to some art instruction now. Um, well, before we get into it, I'd like to remind you, if you're new to the channel or if you haven't done so yet, to make sure you subscribe and click on the notification bell so you're notified when we do uh, these live broadcasts and also the, the videos that we put out on, on regular occasion. Um, and... Um, you know, if you haven't checked out our membership program yet, you should check that out. Uh, we have a membership program over at thevirtualinstructor.com, which includes a variety of drawing and painting courses on a variety of media and subject matter, and uh, weekly live lessons as well. Now, what we're doing here tonight on Getting Sketchy is, is kind of rough and loose. That's why we call it Getting Sketchy, but uh, the live lessons are more in-depth, and uh, they're for an hour each week. 
We do those usually in a series where uh, a piece of artwork is created from start to finish over a, a series of lessons. Uh, those are also included in the program and uh, weekly critiques as part of the Members Minute and a year-long curriculum for visual arts teachers. All of that is included in the program. So if you want to learn more about the program, there's a link in the description below. You can go check that out, of course. And uh, if you want to dabble a little bit and just check out three of our course videos and eBooks for free, you can do that as well. There's a link in the description below. You can go check that out as well, but don't do that yet uh, because we're about to get sketchy. Um, so hello to all of you guys from all over the world here. Uh, you guys join us from all over the globe, honestly, and it's amazing that you do because mm -hmm. it's convenient for us here. It's 6.30 p.m. Uh, where we are, so it's just it's still light outside, actually, which is nice. Well, we have daylight savings time yeah. has kicked in here in the States. That's true. I bet you. I was looking at some I bet comments. You were missing some people. Yeah, they haven't started everywhere. You know, Germany yeah. hasn't started yet. So there's possible that some, some of our uh, regular guests aren't with us because. Um, they may tune in. What? Wait, did we spring forward? Yeah, they may tune in in an hour. So I hope that's not the case. But uh, we have sprung forward here in the states. Yeah, which is awesome. I love it because and this more it daylight. may be for the last time. We're good to, we're trying right, it again. I heard that. In the United States, we're trying to permanently stay on daylight savings time again. We've tried it before. We tried it in the 1970s, and it just didn't fly. I don't remember that. I was born in the 70s, so this is the first time in my lifetime that we're given a legitimate go to get rid of uh, switching the times around, and I think I'm for it, too. I like the daylight in the evenings. Yeah, I like the daylight. Of course, I prefer I, the daylight in the I'm evenings. doing a farming theme, of course, right. so you know I like daylight savings time <laughs> down on the farm. Um, right. Well, that won't give Ashley longer than 45 minutes to draw. Oh, drawing, I was hoping I would get an hour and 45 minutes to draw. No, no daylight savings time for you. Uh, anyway... Uh, so hopefully people will trickle in here in just a few minutes. So. If they're not already here, looks like there's a good number of you here anyway. So maybe you got the YouTube notifications. Um, anyway, each one, each uh, one of us is doing a motif this season. And my motif, as I mentioned before, are facial features and or is facial features. And tonight we're going to be drawing an ear. So I think we're ready to get into it. Uh, so let's go ahead and switch over here. Oh, I knew I forgot to tell you something, and that is if you want the photo reference uh, here, if you want to use the photo reference, if you go to the YouTube channel, that's my YouTube channel, uh, there's a little icon of my face down in the corner. You can click on that, and uh, there's a community tab, and you'll see that photo reference there under the community tab, um, and of course, look for the ear. Um, <laughs> but the photo reference is going to be up right over here. Boy, that was a big old finger that came in there. Look how big that is. <laughs> And the reason why my finger is so big is because the space that I'm working in here tonight is still relatively small. This is three inches by 3.5 inches. Now the actual photo reference here uh, that I'm working from is actually three inches by 3.6 inches. So it's a little bit longer than what I've got, but at least I've got a little bit of a space planned out here. So I'll need to keep that in mind as I'm uh, trying to fit the ear into this box. Now, um, I'm going to be using Mars Lumograph black pencils. I'm using the same media, or the same combination of media, I should say, for this entire uh, season for consistency reasons, because we're doing facial features. And next week, or not next week, but the week after next, I'll be doing an entire face. Um, it'll be pretty quick, but it'll still be an entire face. And I'll be using the same mediums. Um, but anyway, these pencils are, uh, are, they have their positives and negatives, I've learned. But um, they're half carbon, maybe not half carbon, but they're, I think they're mostly carbon with a little bit of graphite in there as well. So there's less shine. In fact, there's hardly any noticeable shine, especially with the darker pencils. But it's a little bit harder to blend these pencils because there's so much carbon in them. And the carbon pencils, if you've ever used a carbon pencil, it doesn't smear or blend like a charcoal pencil or like a graphite pencil. It's kind of a little bit more in feel uh, to a wax-colored pencil. Hmm. So um, that, these are the dark pencils that I'm going to be using. And I'm going to be using a 2B, an 8B, and an HB. And I'm also going to be using some white charcoal here uh, in pencil form to uh, add the highlights and lighter values. And I also have a few blending stumps over here as well. And a kneaded eraser, um, which I'll be using maybe. Um, we'll see. Mm -hmm. And the paper I'm working on is Strathmore 400 series toned gray paper 
Love this paper. It's excellent for colored pencils. It's excellent for combining markers with colored pencils, surprisingly. It's also great for doing what we're doing here, combining a dark media with a white media to create a broad range or a full range of value. Value is the darkness or lightness of a color, and we need to make sure that we have a full range of value in this drawing, and we've got the tools to do so. All right, are we ready to go? we have any questions Yeah, I think already? so. Um, there's uh, just a few comments in caps, mostly about... Uh, the time change, but I want to remind everybody, if you if you would like for to make sure that your question or comment is seen, just put it in all caps so that it stands out from the rest. Another and thing I forgot we to do say. have, that's okay. <laughs> that's what I'm here for. So uh, I can remember the little bits or you can remember the bits that I forget. Um, Matthew, I see that your question is now in all caps. I was going to read it anyway because I did happen to see it, but Matthew Russell asks, do you recommend Faber-Castell um, graphite pencils and i certainly do i draw yes. with them every single day yes um they're actually my favorite wooden pencils yeah i think use. they're just um in fact the, they're sort of the standard oh actually i do like faber castle but um i spoke uh oh i spoke out of turn it's actually oh you like the derwent, derwent pencils yeah they're good like pencils the best, they're good yeah. pencils i use the faber castle every day uh you can't really go wrong with faber castle mm -hmm. derwent steedler all of these products are excellent. Yeah. Just stay, well, I'm not, never mind. No, I, we, I'm not going to name brands you should stay away from. <laughs> because, you know, there's some brands that I don't prefer and probably you don't prefer yeah. that other people absolutely yeah, love. Yeah, and I don't want to, I'll tell you what we like, and that's probably probably good there. All right. Yeah. Uh, I hear this drawing calling me. Hello. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> I hear you. All right, obviously we're going to be drawing this ear from the side of the head instead of like a straight-on view or a three-quarter view. Um, and when we draw the portrait, that portrait, ironically enough, has two ears. Uh, the, I've already picked out the, the reference that we're we'll working from. They, there's two ears there. So we'll be, get to draw the ear from a frontal view at least. So in this well, that's particular good. drawing, I'm going to draw it from the side. I know that's a little bit different from that, the eye, the nose, and the mouth that we've already mm -hmm. drawn. But... It's okay. And I'm going to do my best, and Ashley's going to help me here, um, by naming the anatomically correct locations of the ear. Sure, we learned this in the seventh and grade. And I'm going to, I, I don't think I learned this ever, and I am going to mispronounce all of the words that I say. So get ready for that. All right. Um, <laughs> now, there was a question about pencils still. Yeah. Um, with regard to this drawing as a substitute, would you recommend layout pencils or color pencils? And I was going to go with the layout pencils, mm -hmm. but then you are working with a light and dark media. So maybe yeah, color pencils would be better. If you're working on gray paper, maybe uh, well, it's a completely different approach if you use colored pencils. Yeah. Because you're going to have to layer the colored pencils. You're going to have to burnish. You don't have to, but suggested to do that. Um, if you're working on white paper, then definitely the General's Layout Pencil is yeah. the way to go. Um, so hopefully that helps. Yeah, that's what I, I think that's a good answer. It's a total different process if you're going to um, use the colored pencils. And the reason, the reason for that is the colored pencils will give you a range of value, giving you the lighter values, because you can use a white pencil, obviously. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you just use a layout pencil, you've, this is as light as it gets. Every, all your other values are going to be darker, and it's, the drawing's going to be dark. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, all right, I think we're ready. I'll bring up the timer here. We'll have 45 minutes. The first thing I'm going to do here is I'm just going to kind of get an angle of the ear. So... You, you'll notice that the ear is kind of at an angle. I see that. Mm, look at that. At a slant. So I'm just going to very lightly try to capture that angle here. And then I'm going to find where the top of the ear is going to be and the back edge of the ear. And I'm kind of using the photo reference as a guide to figure out where these locations are going to be. So you're looking at the spacing between the ear and yeah, the edge of the picture plane? Yeah, I'm looking at the distance from the top of the picture plane to where the top of the ear is, and also the edge of the picture plane to where the edge of the ear is. And I'm also going to look at the bottom, but remember the photo reference is a little bit longer than my picture plane that I've created. So I'm going to okay. go a little bit longer down here at the bottom. So to do this, you need a picture plane that is the same or real close to the same in proportion to the reference photo. So if yeah. you're just drawn in the middle of your sketchbook page, this uh, this method isn't going to work for you. Right. And that's why it's a lot of times important to, to create a picture plane, especially when you're working in a, in a small picture plane like I am with the sketch, because mm -hmm. um, it kind of helps you lay out the drawing initially. Um, all right. Now I'm going to start working down here at the bottom of the ear, and this would be the 
lobule. That's right, the lobule. Or the lobule? Lobule. What is it? What is it? Is it lobule? So I've always called it the ear lobe. I think so let's it's go the with, lobe. Let's go with lobule. Lobule. Yeah. Let's go with that. Um, I like that. And, and then you're going to work your way up and around to the helix. I, I am, yes. The helix is actually over here. That's right. You've, right? Already, you've already captured the helix. Um, and I want you to keep in mind when I'm drawing this ear, and this is true for any facial feature, every facial feature is different from mm -hmm. other people's facial features. And that's what makes us look different. But from especially other the ears, they seem so variable. Oh, ears are super varied. Um, so since this is kind of a nondescript ear, you don't have to get so obsessed with making it perfect. Of course, you want to practice your drawing skills, but uh, if you're just kind of practicing drawing an ear, uh, if everything is not perfectly in alignment, then it's not that big of a deal as long as you've got the basic shape in the right place. Of course, if you're doing a portrait of a, a person and you're doing the entire portrait, then it's a little bit more crucial to get things as accurate as possible. But, so the reason why I'm saying this is even though there's kind of a little bit of a formula we can go through to uh, create a drawing of an ear or a nose, more specifically an eye, a nose, and a mouth. If you've watched the other videos, you, can, mm -hmm. you will see that I kind of went through a step-by-step -step process. It was still drawn through observation, obviously, but there was a process of observation. So even though it wasn't a formula, it was still a process that I went through to arrive at the drawing. An ear is a little bit different. Um, I'm drawing this purely from observation. So I'm, I'm measuring things. I'm looking at relationships, just like I would draw any other subject. But um, even though there's a formula, you got to keep in mind or somewhat of a formula, you got to keep in mind that every ear, every eye, every nose, every mouth is different. So there's going to be a little bit of a deviation. And this little part right here uh, kind of goes straight across. Yeah, it's almost level up there. You know, I guess we can make up whatever name for this because that's not on our labeled photos nope. that we're working from. Let's call it the top flap. <laughs> I like top flap. I like flap. top flap. That seems like a uh, pretty... You call eyelids um, eye flaps, right? Yeah. So I'm, I'm sticking with the flap. Well, well you know... Your flaps and eye flaps. I have some kind of gene <laughs> that makes the eye flaps um, more noticeable. Yeah. I don't know if you've noticed this, but all of my kids have these oh, yeah. wide eye flaps. Right. Um, so I've it's always part of your genetics. Them, yeah, it's part of my genetics. Somebody else mentioned that, um, you know, due to genetics, some people's uh, lobule is connected. It doesn't really hang below right. their face. It you feeds right into it. Dangly so that's one. one of those major differences. This in is features. a dangly one. And actually, the photo that we're, we've got here with the locations of the ear, mm -hmm. we have the same. <laughs> yeah. Up with, it's with a connected these, lobe. With these uh, labeled parts. Um, it has a connected one, mm -hmm. so there you go. All right. So, so maybe it's a lobule if it's connected, but a lobe if it's not. No, that's not right. No, that can't be that's right. That's not right. <laughs> All right, so you can see this line that comes down here. This is called the uh, uh, scafa, 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 uh, whatever this little edge here rolls around. It doesn't go all the way down, but it does kind of connect where it lines up with the top part of this line. So where the lobe, oh, lobule ends up, that's a, that's a connection it's I can make. close to directly across, yeah. So that, this is drawing from observation. This is one of these things that we do to make comparisons so that we get some accuracy in Check, our drawings. Uh, yeah. horizontal and vertical alignment. Right. That's so a big one for me too. Line up. Yeah. And then I can also look at the inside of the the curvature right here and see that it kind of comes down, it looks like right in the dead center of the ear. So right in the dead center. Why do they call it the dead center? Um, I mean, this isn't a riddle. Up. I have no idea. Why don't they call it the law center? That's has to much do with, more uplifting. I guess it has to do with aiming. And if you hit something in the center you're aiming at, you would kill it. If you're thinking it about oh, wow. like a rifle analogy, that kind of a thing, maybe. Yeah. I'm just making this up. Maybe Thanks you guys know in the Jack chat. Ripper. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, Matthew says he can't wait to see how this drawing comes out tonight. And you've got a really good start on it already. There's some um, specificity in the contour around the edges. So it's not just any ear. It's a specific ear tonight. It is a specific ear. 
And now that we're going to work on this inner line here. And, you know, so many people draw ears that kind of look like cauliflowers. Um, they just they'll, they just put lines in there. You know? Oh, yeah, I know what you mean. Um, and it's real easy to do that. You know, when you look at it here, there's all these overlapping shapes and things mm -hmm. here. Um, but we've got this little part that kind of juts out, and there's a little bit of a lighter value here. And then it goes back and then back up here a little bit further away from this lawn here. From the uh, the antitragus. And That's the, that hump there in the middle is the antitragus. And I'm gonna bring it over a little bit further because this shape right in here needs to be, feels like it needs to be a little bit wider. So I may have made the ear actually a little bit skinnier, longer and skinnier, but that's okay. We'll keep going here. Longer and skinnier than the ear in the reference. And we'll go up right up underneath here. And this is where it's the darkest. That's so something I look around. for early is to find my darkest area or my darkest value. So that's where that'll be the one at one end of our value spectrum up there in that little crevice. And I might do a little bit of some hatching here so I can remember that that is the darkest area. Mm hmm. And the ear, to me, anyway, it's very similar to the nose where we get some lines in place, and then after that, it's developing value. Mm -hmm. um, so we've got some lines in place. Now, I'm going to go ahead and plan out where we have another area of dark value, and this is a little bit of a recess. This is called the fossa trag trag <laughs> triangularis. <laughs> the fossa triangularis a little more um, value in your fossa triangularis yeah, you need a little bit more value in your fossa triangularis um you ought to tomorrow at school you ought to just say all right guys today we're drawing ears I was, everywhere i look in so, this classroom it's nothing but fossa <laughs> triangularis <laughs> so um turn your tri turn your fossa tri triangularis to me i need to see your fossa triangular i'll get fired if i say you that. would That's i need to I see your say. fossa triangularis <laughs> <laughs> Mr. We're, Hurst, what are, what are you in there talking about tri fossa <laughs> triangularis with your students? What's going on there? Can you even spell fossa triangularis? Yeah. And then you'll pull up this photo. And We're just it. having fun <laughs> trying to use the correct names because usually we make up names and uh, for, for animals. <laughs> and maybe that's better. I don't, I don't know how too. you're taking this out there. Maybe it's better for us to just make up words. Make, you know, make up our own. All right. So I'm just going to go ahead and extend out some of this uh, darker value here so you can get a little bit of an indication of some of the form before we start going ham on this ear. Do you know what ha going ham means? Going ham? Yeah. Do you know what that means? I don't, I think it probably, I'm, I don't, I'm okay. From context clues, I'm yeah. going to guess that it just sort of means go crazy, go all out on it. Okay. Let it all hang out. Don't well, hold was, anything That was back. a legitimate question. Like I was really asking. Oh, okay. No. Because my oldest daughter uses it. Well, that, you know, it's, it seems, sounds like, you know, it's too cool for me right now. So I'm trying to figure out what And I've means. only picked up from context clues what okay. it could mean. So. I'm not very good at context clues. <laughs> um, so we may not be using ham right. I <laughs> uh, just hope it's not a derogatory statement. I think, it's, <laughs> I think it's okay to say that we're going ham on this ear here with the value. But we're not yet. We're, we're holding back on the ham. Right now we're, <laughs> we're just getting things warmed up. Now, down here on the lobe, the lobule, the lobule, why can't they just call it a lobe? You know, why do yeah. you, you got to put a yule at the end? <laughs> um, there is a shadow that r reaches down because the light source is coming from above and it's slightly to the right. So that is putting a All little right. bit of a It looks like, um, I don't know if, if Simon um, didn't hear earlier uh, where the reference photo is, but let's see. It's on your YouTube channel. Is that right? We're looking for the reference yes. photo right yeah. now. Just go to... Click on the uh, little icon of my face. Uh, if okay. You, it, and that will take you to the YouTube channel, and there's a community tab. If you click on the community tab, you'll see all of the photo references for Getting Sketchy this season. Okay. So or the ones we've done so far. So they're still there from this season, yeah, they're even still from there, last yeah. week and the week before. So yeah. mm -hmm. click on Matt's face, and then click on community tab on his YouTube channel. Now, I'm being a little bit tentative with the... Uh, 
the addition of the value here. I should probably. Oh, look, there's only there's 33 minutes left. Yeah. I, it's already an ear. What did you say? It's all, it's already in here. You got 33 minutes. Huh? So plenty of <laughs> I love you, Dad. Uh, let me, uh, yeah, that's a good one, isn't it? I just wanted to hear you say it again. <laughs> anytime, sweet... anytime that commercial comes on, I stop whatever I'm doing and watch the whole thing. And when they cut that commercial short, I get so upset about it. Oh, you do? You want it's to see the, the funniest thing on TV. The hearing aid commercial where the son keeps telling his father he loves him and he can't hear. It is so funny. I love it. All right, so this is still the HP Pencil, and I'm getting ready to add some of the lighter values here. And the reason why I'm going to switch and start adding some of the lighter values is because the white charcoal pencil will not cover over these marks. Uh, but so we kind of have to think about the order in which we apply the material. I am going to put a little bit of shading here on the ear. And when I'm talking about adding value or developing value, that's what most people refer to as shading. Uh, mm -hmm. But I don't think that's fair because we're shading and tinning. Um, True. <laughs> I like to you, say rendering. Rendering, I yes. picked up that from a teacher of mine a long time ago. And, you know, I learned a long time ago, and I don't know how accurate this is, but I teach people this, that rendering refers to creating a drawing with both a dit additive and subtractive processes. Oh, okay. So using an eraser. Well, then that's what we're doing. I mean, we, yeah. we, anytime we're working with value, we're having to go in both ways. Even if we right. start with white paper, most of the time, at some point in there, you might use your eraser. Um, but on, uh, I guess on gray paper, you're, you're not really subtracting necessarily, but you're still moving in both directions, kind of like you would with an eraser on white right. paper. Right, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, anyway... A lot of times people refer to this as shading, and uh, shades are actually the darker values, and tints are the lighter values. So, and value is the darkness or lightness of a color. So that is why it should be called shading and tinting. Now the HB pencil here with these black pencils is a little bit shiny, so hopefully it's not... Now, Matt, Too since shiny. you had the question earlier, and this is a little um, back, I guess we're going backwards a little bit, but you'd mentioned you wonder where dead center comes from. Yeah. And we have a name for We have an answer for that, and it totally makes sense All now. All right. So I believe this was, uh, thank you for helping us out, Javi Jav. The answer is still on my screen, so I can actually read it verbatim. According to word etymology, dead center um, means in the exact middle. And uh, the noun phrase from 1836 is in reference to lathes or other rotating machinery, meaning the point in the center of which actually doesn't revolve. Okay. That's what makes it dead. And then all the points I outside gotcha. of that, that are moving. That makes absolute great perfect It makes sense, sense and it's not, it's not um, murderous, like right. my suggestion. has nothing to do with pirates or Jack the Ripper, although I saw <laughs> a lot of great pirate jokes in there. R, did you? Lots of R's. Um, well, that's good to know. I love curious people. Mm -hmm. I love it when we don't know something and, Which and is, somebody tells us. It's often. I learn something every day. And I'm going to, I'm, I'm sure I'm going to tell somebody that at some point. Say, hey, did you know where Dead Center cam, comes from? Well, let me tell you. <laughs> Brent does R says, I thought you camped in tents under shade. Say, say that again. I thought you camped in tents under shade. Oh, very good. Ooh, Play on yeah, words that's a good there. One. That is in so tents punny. Under shade. I punny, love punny, it. Punny, punny, punny. <laughs> if I remember right, I think Brent does art had some good ones a few weeks ago too. We Was were... it the? What were we working on? Was that one of yours? Your last drawing? Was it the mouth drawing? I can't I, remember. Maybe it was when you were doing the rooster. Might have been. I can't remember. Timothy says, drawing an ear, uh, drawing an ear Van Gogh comes to mind. Yeah, you're right about that. Yeah. And uh, we, did, we talked a little bit about Van Gogh at the top of the hour. And so uh, I don't know about Matt. Van Gogh is one of my favorite um, historical artists. And I uh, feel a little bit like, like a bandwagoner saying that because he's so popular nowadays. You know, he's, he's really at the height of his popularity. Um, definitely uh, compared to his lifetime, uh, because he wasn't popular at all. But uh, I'm a big fan of Vincent Van Gogh's color choices, really. His, oh, yeah. his use of color schemes is uh, top-notch. People don't realize this, but Van Gogh was a real uh, student of art. Mm -hmm. And 
he uh, learned how to draw and paint fairly representationally before he before he deviated sort of developed his style right yeah Yeah. Um, all right you might have noticed that i erased the outer contour here and that's because the outer line right here is actually a lighter value so if i would have Ah, left that darker value there um, it would look a little a little odd look a little less natural and i'm going in here with the white charcoal here and i'm going to take a pretty conservative approach here applying this initially before doing some blending with my stump and you can see in the reference that the edge of the ear and where it meets the skin the values are e- almost exactly the same so We'll need a little bit of differentiation there. And what I think I'm going to do is I'm going to actually make the value behind the edge of the ear a little bit darker Mm -hmm. when we get to it so that there's contrast there. And that happens a lot when you're creating a drawing or painting from a photo reference. Uh, You've got to think about how your drawing is going to translate. And a drawing or painting should translate as something, in my opinion, should translate something different than a photo unless... You are. Tr- that's the whole point, is just to create a, a photorealistic drawing. Mm-hmm. Uh, but most of the time, you're trying to put some something in the art uh, so that it is art, and so it's uniquely yours. Um, and, you know, those little deviations that you have to do sometimes to communicate the subject, it contributes to that, contributes to that art part where you're uh, creating something unique and maybe expressive that is a deviation from the subject. So, you know, just like when we did the nose a few weeks ago, the same rules apply here. Areas that protrude are are typically going to catch light and produce a lighter value, and areas that recede are typically going to see some shadow uh, because light can't get in there. So uh, that's what's happening here with the ear all the areas that protrude out especially on the right side of the ear are are capturing a lot of the light and producing lighter values and all the areas that are recessed are a little bit darker because the light can't get in there I am focusing on the ear right now and not the areas around the ear Mm -hmm. uh, just so I can make sure I have enough time to address the ear. (laughs) Well, it really looks like the the way the shading just kind of fades out in the front of the ear, it feels like it's growing right out of the page right now. It's starting to project. Even without a darker value behind it, like you mentioned, just because the paper's still darker. Just because the paper, just the grayness of the paper. Yeah, Yeah, that's enough right Um, now. Now, this is kind of a, uh, a sketchier look right now uh, because you can see the tooth or texture of the paper. And I can keep going this direction. There'd be nothing wrong with it. Um, but the other drawings that I've done this season are blended out. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to blend this one out too, but just to make sure it's consistent. But I just want you to see at this stage that it's perfectly acceptable to use the gray of the paper as your middle value. That's how I work more on gray paper. I like yeah. to find... Where I can not use, you know, not use my medium and let the paper do a little bit of the work. Sometimes that causes you to actually keep the white and the darker medium kind of separate from one mm-hmm. another. Definitely. Um, I was going to say that the only issue that you, you sometimes can run into with that, which is not happening here, but I'm sure you can imagine, if the grays that you make or the material that you're using is a cooler or warmer gray compared to the color of the paper for example oh yeah it then it then yeah then things can look a little strange but that usually doesn't happen but i've seen it happen before there's a discussion going on in the chat around crayons using crayons maybe as a challenge for one of these and i'm not sure it's not clear (laughs) if it's for um necessarily if it's for everyone in the chat to try crayons instead of what we're using or for one of us to use crayons but i have a student yeah i do too and i have a student right now that has really gotten into drawing with crayons 
just regular, you know, crayon. I mean, he's, he's sharpening them. You know, he's trying to master the medium. Mm -hmm. And he's done about three portraits in this last week and a half in crayons. And so I've been talking about crayons a lot in the last week and a half or so um, because of his drawing. So I'm not entirely averse to that. I mean, it's still drawing with wax. And yeah. we use wax with colored pencils, and wax is a common material used in sculpture. Wax is a really important art supply. And so I think we could, we could work that in at some point. Yeah, crayons are kind of like just bulky colored pencils. They're like, they're like really, really soft, thick colored pencils. Mm. Now, I did have a student this year um, who wanted to do some wax painting, and we don't really have encaustic supplies, so she used our, and this is not safe, um, but we used, pro we had ventilation to some degree. Uh, I just want to say that. You know, I'm not killing my students in the classroom, <laughs> but we, me we melted the wax um, in a, uh, in like a, Hot plate, kind of like a hot plate. I don't oh, know. It's some, yeah. It's some sort of a, of a of a kitchen appliance that my mom used to make sloppy joes in. I think when I was a kid. Did you do Something a crayon like batik? Is that yeah. What it's, yeah. Well, we, we we got the batiking supplies out, but yeah. then we just used stiff bristle brushes and painted with them right out of the hot plate. So it was more like encaustic. Yeah. Um, and then uh, we used a heat gun and heated up the surface and made it really, really smooth at the end, which was real, which is pretty cool. It's very unique looking. I've really haven't seen a painting like it. We even found some clear crayons to work into the mix, so we have some oh, translucency, wow. like a colorless blender. Yes, yes, it was a colorless blender crayon, and light will pass into the painting in certain places. Wow. Where we made smoke, it was a forest fire. It's crazy looking. Where in the world? Do I'm going to have to show you this crayon. Painting. I found it in a in a I think a Prang pack of crayons. I think it was a Prang uh, of brand. It's Prang. Prang is a good. Prang uh, is the art uh, is teacher's. A, yeah, right. It's a good uh, crayon, crayon brand. choice. Mm -hmm. More wa more wax, better colors, rich colors. Yeah, I learned that from our our uh, mutual friend Betty. Who, uh, yeah, that's she, right. I was just had that in mm -hmm. my mind because. With her crayon etchings, boy, you she did came not to my use. school for a couple of months to fill in. And yeah, she saw our crayons and said, "I can't use these." Yeah, she was. And so we had to order her like fifty <laughs> sets of crayons. Oh man, I don't know. I don't know if Betty's watching this or not. It's possible. It's possible. It's possible. Um, our crayons were in such bad shape, and those crayons are so nice. I remember ordering supplies for her. I think I think it was her ordering supplies for uh, summer art honors, mm -hmm. and she. We had to have those praying uh, uh, crayons for the. For well, the they, they do make a difference. They do they make a difference. Better, yeah. They are a better crayon. So, all right, let's see. Well, I've been going on about crayons. The chat has filled up with, with capital letters. So, let's read some of these comments. Um, let's see. Sarah Bain says, how do you sharpen your pencils, both graphite and charcoal, please? Um, interestingly, Bain is my middle name. Uh, well, interesting enough. <laughs> uh, a few weeks ago, I published a video on how to sharpen any pencil, and it's oh, on perfect. YouTube. So you can watch that. But uh, you can sharpen pencils in a variety of different ways, and I use all of them. I <laughs> use standard uh, sharpeners, like disposable sharpeners. Like here is one. This. Uh, these are, that's probably my favorite way to sharpen. It's quick and easy. Um, I also have, let's see here. I think I'm pretty good on the Tom. So. Yeah, you've got 20 minutes and your ear is looking sculptural. It looks like it's made oh, of thanks. marble already. I'm just going to pull that's out really some good. of these sharpeners here that I have uh, just sitting here. Um, <laughs> Oh, you all thought, within short, all within you, short reach. You thought <laughs> there's coming. another one. Um, and that one's for your letter. There's holder. more in here, but I'm going to have pencil shavings all. Yeah, over those my are pretty good. Artwork. Um, and yeah. I, but also, I also you, I know that's not telling you how to sharpen. Pencil. Right. They want to know how you get that super long tip that tapers on there. Right. That's, like I'm something sure. like this is what mm -hmm. you're talking yeah. about. And to sharpen a pencil like a this, has a curved I taper. Use a blade. And I cut away from my body and expose the material. And then I use a sanding pad like this and just rotate the pencil over the sanding pad. That's how it gets that curved taper to it. Yeah. yeah. Um, and when I'm doing end. a more precise pencil drawing, I typically sharpen the pencil that way. Um, so, yeah. Um, but I sharpen pencils all different ways. 
And I'm sure Ashley does the same. Mm -hmm. I too. use, I pretty much use hobby knives almost exclusively. And then I just use the knife to shave my lead down into a round barrel instead of using the uh, sandpaper. So I do it all with a knife. I'm too many, that's too many tools for me. Matt got all those sharpeners out. It looks super complicated. That would overwhelm me. So I just well, use the I hobby Well, I only use knife. one sharpener at a time. I'm not like <laughs> using all of them. All right. Now it's time for sharpener number four. Right, right. We're getting there. We're getting close. Okay, Brent does art ask. So Prismacolor art sticks are basically crayons, right? Right. They're basically hard crayons that apparently have been discontinued. So I apologize. I used those on the show about five weeks ago, and it doesn't look like they make them anymore. Yeah, but the art sticks are much harder than they are hard than crayons. They're a hard wax crayon. If you, you can, you, it doesn't quite feel the same. You could think of um, a good comparison would be like crayons are like soft pastels, mm -hmm. and art sticks are like hard pastels. If you get that comparison. Um, obviously I've pulled out a blending stop here and I'm using the blending stop to uh, basically work some of the material into the tooth of the paper. So it gives it a little bit more of a smoother appearance. And I like to use uh, one blending stop for the darker values and then one for the lighter values. So I'm going kind of over the darker values now. And then once we've got this kind of blended, we'll go back and push the value range. So we'll make some of the values a little bit darker. Although in person, I'm not really sure why the camera is doing this. Maybe it needs to be adjusted a little bit. But in person, the, va the value is, is light in my drawing. But on camera, it looks like the value is dark. Hmm. Um, so I'm going to have to keep that in mind so that I don't get too dark with things here. But th the great thing about using a blending stump is it gets material on it. And then you can take that material and move it into areas where you want to just have a, uh, a slight slightly darker value in this case. And if you're blending the light material, of course, you could be a slightly lighter value. So you can see I have material on the blending stop and we have these areas of uh, just smooth gradations of value. I've, I've almost covered all of them. I'm looking for another area where I can put down some of this material that's already on here. Here's a little place. So there's a little bit of a subtle shadow on the other side of this part, which is the Wait a minute. The anti... The, the ant... Ant... Tea. Ant helix. That's, That's it. I was trying to remember without looking at my notes. Is it ant helix? The ant helix. Yeah, the ant helix. Ant or the, the ant helix. What, who is it responsible for naming these parts of the ear? Some old Roman. Some old Roman? Some old Roman, I guess. Well, not really, but these are probably, you know, Latin. These are Latin words. Latin root words would be my guess. All right, let's see... Um, I had a question and missed, oh, I think the question was, uh, sorry, it was from Raul. Do you sharpen the blending stumps? Do you sharpen yours? Ashley does. I don't. That's right. Um, I just use mine until they are and, usable And Matt anymore. likes to use them dirty. You know, he was just talking about, yeah. or not dirty, but loaded. We'll call them loaded. He likes them loaded so he can kind of draw and paint with them. And I do too, but uh, but sometimes I need them clean. So I will sharpen mine on the same sandpaper pad, not the same one, but a sandpaper pad just like the one Matt showed that he finishes sharpening his pencils on. I use the same type of sandpaper pad. Often they come with stumps if you buy a little kit or a set. Um, and then you just, you just kind of rub, rub them back and forth try to keep the same angle on the cone is similar to, you know, to the manufacturer's angle. And uh, it does a pretty good sharpener. They get a little fuzzy. Um, I've switched over now to a blending stop that has been mostly used for lighter values. <gasps> Javi tells you that the fossa triangularis is breathtaking. Oh, like it, like on everybody's? No, your, yours. Oh, your, my, your, thank your you. drawn fossa thank triangularis. You. Thank you. Um, I definitely wanted it tonight. I sat down and I was like, you know, if I don't do anything else, I want to make sure that the fossa triangularis is breathtaking. You got to nail it. You got to get the fossa triangularis. <laughs> um, thank you for that. So I typically like to use the lighter blending stop to work into the darker value. So from the lighter value. So if I've got a transition like I have here, I'll pull some of the lighter tone into the darker tone. It's not always the case, but it seems like that kind of works a little bit better than going the opposite direction. Because if I'm, if I make things too dark, it's a little bit harder to reverse that. But if I make things too light, it's much easier to reverse that. So I tend to like to uh, make things a little bit lighter than I need to, and then go back and make them darker if necessary. Mm -hmm. All 
I'm not going to worry about any of the hair or any of the other stuff that's happening here, if you're wondering. Norlene, the little black sheep, asks, what is the live lesson tonight? Uh, we are continuing our series on um, painting blueberries with acrylics. Now, let's and see. Is tonight the fourth lesson? Tonight is the fourth lesson, okay. and we're going to try to paint a whole row of blueberries tonight. Wow. I don't know if that will happen, but I have ambitious plans for this evening. And, and you've if, sort of, now, you've, we you have know, some you've time, kind of I'll found your you process, painting, I guess. Yeah. yeah, you should show the painting to everybody so they can see where you're at with it. It's very different from the type of drawings we do here. Yeah. Um, and the, the reason why I'm ambitious tonight about painting a whole row of blueberries is because when I did the homework, now it could be because I wasn't talking, <laughs> um, it, the, the homework was to finish off two blueberries in the background behind them. Uh, along with their shadows, and that went that went pretty quick. Okay. Um, and it may be because I've just got my process down, or I have a, a better idea of how it's supposed to work, and um, it went a little bit faster. But it also could be due to the fact that I was alone here in the studio, and there was no one to talk to. It goes a little faster <laughs> sometimes when you're not uh, talking. That's true. It goes a lot faster. I when tell you're my not students talking. in class the same thing. If you just stop talking, you get your artwork done. Yeah, that doesn't work, does it? Mm -mm. <laughs> All right. So by applying these dark and light values and then going over the top of them with a blending stump, what happens is they get muted to a certain degree. Um, the values and the contrast in the values, I should say, is not quite as strong. And that gives us the opportunity to go back and bump up the contrast. Um, Ordinal Plays asks, what type of blending stump is that? Uh, well, actually, it's just a stump. It says number seven on it. Okay. I have no idea what brand it is. Does it say made in China or anything like yeah, that? Yeah, but it? I'm sure it was not made in the United okay, States. Okay, just checking. Um, and this Didn't is have... a blending tortilla. Yeah, and they're I actually hollow. I prefer the tortillas over the stumps. Show like them the back just... end of that so they yeah, can see the difference. This is actually, a tortilla is rolled paper. Just has one end for blending. And a blending stump is actually compressed paper. Mm, it's real tight. Yeah. Or much harder. Yeah. But they work about the same. Yeah, they did the same thing. But uh, I kind of like the way a tortilla feels in my hand. Although the stump I just used for the lighter values, I really like that one, that big, thick one. Yeah, I like the big stumps. Yeah. They do make really tiny ones, but it's getting like a like a pixie stick skinny, but I like the big fat stumps myself. Yeah, this is kind of a pixie stick skinny. Mm -hmm. And it's got a little bit of uh, material on it, so create a little bit of a, shuttle, a subtle shadow here before making the, the edge a little bit lighter and bumping up the contrast. So let's bump up the contrast now. You know, um, I'm gonna go to a 2B pencil next. That was all with the HB pencil, and because this is looking so so dark on screen already. I am probably not going to use the 8B pencil. I don't think I need to. I think that value is pretty dark in there. Mm -hmm. So now that we've uh, got our initial applications in place, we can go back here and bump up the contrast. And these applications don't necessarily need to be blended. You can blend them if you want, but I'm not going to really try to fight the tooth too much here. So I'm just going to make a few areas a little bit darker. Matthew Russell says, this drawing is coming out amazing. And by the way, I loved Thanks. your last video on the orange slices in acrylic. I like, And I was admiring that uh, painting last week, I believe. Great. I appreciate it. The, the painting videos, for whatever reason, just don't get as many views as the drawing videos. Everyone loves to draw. Mm -hmm. Not as many people love to paint. Still drawing. Not yet. Yeah, they that's don't. Right. We're working on that. Bringing them yeah, around. Yeah, it's... Seems scary, I think, for a lot of a lot of folks who've, you know, spent more time with with a stiff tool and dry media in their hands. Things well, like yeah. pencils and pens—they're just more common. You know, we don't grow yeah. up with a brush in our hand, and I think right. it feels a little scary at first. Yeah, it's it's less uh, accessible. Mm -hmm. Accessible. 
because you have to have all of the painting supplies. Um, Ellie asks, can you make your own blending stump or tortillion? Sure you can. Mm -hmm. And in fact, um, what, what I think probably Matt used to do too, but before we started ordering in the classroom stumps and tortillions for our art program was funded, we pretty much used the soft, softish um, paper towels and folded up paper footballs. And that gave us three points to, to blend and to shade with. So if you know how to fold a paper football, that's a great blending stump. And you really, I don't make a paper football. I just keep folding into a triangles until it gets pretty stiff in the tips and use that. And the best thing about those blending stumps is when there's downtime in the classroom, you can play a little paper football game. Yeah. And uh, now you could try to fold trouble. one, like you could try to roll your own, but I mean, they're, they are rolled so tightly all the way to the dead center, right? The part that wouldn't rotate um, yeah. that I don't think you could roll one up tight enough. So I think I would go with folding paper, like a paper football, as opposed to trying to, trying to roll one up. Yeah, and these the blending stumps and and tortillas are really so cheap. That's why I, I don't even bother sharpening them because you can buy a whole pack of them for a few dollars. Yeah. And a whole pack, if you use them like I do, will last you for a very long time. So um, the reason I would make one is because I just don't have time to wait for it to be delivered or drive to the store. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah. So. Next time you go to the art store, just pick up a couple of packs and you're good for a while. Um, de again, depending on how you use them. Some people might get a little bit, uh, go ham with their hair <laughs> blending <stuff. laughs> um, And if that's the case, you might be blending big areas of charcoal. Who knows what you're doing? Then if, if that's the case, then you'll probably run through them a little bit quicker. So again, this blending stump already had some material on it. So I'm just taking it and adding to that shadow. Hmm. Um, Orion Nebula believes the reason that, you, you know, people are, tend, to, tend to view drawing videos more than painting videos is that drawing seems more achievable and less messy. And I can buy that. You know, I think a lot of people worry about the, the mess and the cleanup of painting, having a space for it, you know, you, yeah, some, if you're working with acrylic or oil, you need a little more space to spread out so you don't make too big of a mess. So that could be that could be part of it too. All right, I'm going to go in and put some stronger highlights here. And these might be a little bit exaggerated because really the lightest value that I see in here is probably a super light gray. Um, but we can exaggerate the contrast a little bit, right? Mm -hmm. That contrast is why it's so... so uh, formal and dimensional right now. Buddy says, every time I watch how a subject starts to pop out of the paper, I get crazy. You're making Buddy crazy right oh, now. She no, says she buddy, loves don't it. Go crazy. Don't go crazy. I love it too. It feels like I could reach right around behind that ear. And whisper something into it. <laughs> Sweet nothings. Yes. <laughs> now, um, the question probably was asked, and I probably missed it. Where did this ear come from? Whose ear is this, or where did the reference come from? Oh, the reference came from pixabay.com. Okay. Um, and I have no idea whose ear this is. So it's not an ear you know. It's not an ear I know. But if you take my Portrait Drawing the Smart Way course, which is part of the membership program at thevirtualinstructor.com, um, we do draw facial features individually using a combination of media similar to this. Um, and those features are actually, all the features we draw in that course are my wife's. So <laughs> the eyes, the, the mouth, the out. nose, they're all my wife's. And the portraits that we do in that course, one portrait is my wife's grandmother and one portrait is my son, Luke, mm -hmm. uh, years ago. And let's see, is there another portrait we do in that course? Or is that, there's another portrait in the, the guide to graphite that is... My grandfather, when he was in the service, actually said, but um, a lot of times people don't ask about who these people are. But this, this, in this particular case, this is a random ear. This is not an ear I know. And if it was an ear from my family, then you could guarantee that it doesn't listen to me. <laughs> mm -hmm. Matthew says, we're analyzing portrait with bandaged ear by Van Gogh in art class right now. <laughs> nice. That's cool. I'm familiar with that one. I, in fact, I think I had a, I, um, not me, but my colleague 
in the room next to me had a student um, create a music video using figures from art history, and he dressed up like them. And when he dressed up like Van Gogh, that's the picture that he chose to use as this reference. He had the bandaged ear and all. It looked great. Well, speaking of Van Gogh, a few weeks ago I made a video uh, critiquing one of Van Gogh's artworks. So you mm -hmm. mentioned that you're studying Van Gogh's bandaged ear. If you want to study Cafe Terrence at night, there is a pretty lengthy critique of that. Um, on cool. The, on the YouTube channel. Yeah, that one's been in the news lately a little bit. Has it really? I'm yeah. oblivious. Some, some people believe now, and this might have been part of your critique, that it's actually a Last Supper. That's what I did talk about that yeah. in the critique, and that, that's Judas Iscariot in the, in the window, or the opening. Over in the side. Because that figure, if you look at Van Gogh's sketch yeah. for that drawing, that figure is not included. Oh, but in the final drawing, the figure is included, and also a tree. The tree yeah. uh, on the right side was not included in the um, sketch. That's right. And trees were, uh, you know, were uh, are often used in Christian art as a reminder of the cross. And Van Gogh was a preacher, isn't that right? Right. And if again, another analysis is that uh, some of, of the brushstrokes resembled crosses, mm -hmm. or Van Gogh wanted to be a preacher. I don't think he ever okay. became one. And maybe ministers the more technical term yeah i'm not sure we call them preachers around here I'm not sure about the, it's the <laughs> 1800s um but uh pretty neat though so we were actually talking about that in our own uh classes just a couple of weeks ago because it was it was brought up and i was like are you kidding and i started counting everybody started counting all the heads yeah, they're kind of laid out a little bit in a similar way. Mm, a little bit. And then, you know, some of this stuff is from art historians. I, sometimes I feel like we read into paintings, <laughs> especially if you're an art historian. No offense to art historians out right, there. Right, but we know <laughs> that, um, you know, sometimes as artists, sometimes people read things into your artwork that is not there. Mm -hmm. It's and, probably happened to all of us. Yeah, and... Um, I think art historians a lot of times are really good. I mean, they're very knowledgeable, and they also know a lot more about the history of art oh, yeah. than um, I know. But uh, I think sometimes it's easy to read into things. But well, it's very yeah. possible, since Van Gogh was such a student of, uh, of art. Yeah, and, of course, you know, um, so many artists... At one time, in Western art anyway, most of the art that was being made was religious art. So it's very common, it's very, very normal for artists to create and, or recreate their own versions of historical religious pieces. All right, um, let's see. Have you ever used art graph water-soluble graphite? And that's from... I've used water soluble graphite, but what's the, the brand? Pete Collins. I may have said your name wrong. I apologize if I did. It's the art. The brand is Art Graph. Uh, no, I don't think now, so. Now I've used water soluble graphite pencils, but I can't remember the brand right now. But I, I can tell you, I liked them. I, I'm trying to remember. I think the I used the, them in a background. Hey, I got them right here. Hold I on. used them in a background of an artwork that was otherwise just done um, with traditional graphite drawing techniques. And the background felt separated from the foreground because of that. It was loose. Let's see. Is that? Oh, that's Lot by Lyra. That's Lyra. Okay. Yeah. But this is a water-soluble graphite pencil. Mm -hmm. And this stuff's awesome. Yeah, I think so, too. Um, I don't know why I don't use it more often, but it's so dark. So dark. Um, uh, this is a 2B, for example. Doesn't look that dark. But yeah, but when you <laughs> add water to it, but you it, can see how shiny it um, is. Yeah. <laughs> um, but once you add water to it and um, activate it, it gets pretty dark. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, time's up, and you know oh, yeah. what? This one, this one's finished. That ear looks right? great. I love <laughs> it. I could could keep fiddling with it. Could sure. do more stuff in the background, but um, we have an ear here, and I, I'll be honest with you, the ear was probably the quickest of the the. Uh, the facial features that I've done. So mm -hmm. um, pretty straightforward. Again, very similar to the nose, where we draw the contour lines, we figure out the lines, then the rest is just basically developing the value. Now, that's true to a certain degree with all of the facial features, uh, but the eye has some very distinct lines. The mouth also has some very distinct edges and lines. 
But the nose and the ear, the, there's only a few distinct lines, and then the rest is, is a value. Even in these areas where it looks like a line, it's still a gradation of value. Like right here, I've kind of depicted this as a line, but there is a gradation, a slight gradation from dark to light, mm -hmm. and a slight gradation from dark to light because it's a gradual indentation. It's not just an edge. But there are edges, like right here, and this is where we see the greatest contrast in this image, where we do have a hard edge right there, and that's one of the lines that we draw initially. So these areas that we have that are raised up and, and recede back, that's where we're going to see those gradations of value, and that happens a lot within the ear. So We're All getting right. a lot of wonderful comments on this ear. Um, let's see. It's been suggested that it's be, it, that it made it beyond the sketch. It's an actual drawing. And oh I think you gosh, got a lot of so a lot of really subtle and specific value changes in there, especially down in the lobule area, and especially for just forty five minutes. Yeah, that's right. You got the right area. You even lobule. have a little reflected light in there. You added in. Yep. And this, that was yep. just by con for and it, it works. It looks good. So a lot of great comments on this one. A very oh, thank very you. successful drawing. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. And um, oh, and a buddy asked. How can a subject pop so much on gray paper? And I was going to point out this paper feels well, like a warm gray yeah. compared to the cool grays that you've sort of mixed a little mm -hmm. bit. And that's yep. part of it. There's really a, a color contrast here in terms of temperature. Yeah, there's color contrast. It's very subtle. It's very it's, subtle. It's more noticeable if I used graphite. Well, I don't know. Yeah, I'd, I'd say it's probably more noticeable if it's pure graphite. Mm -hmm. um, typically, when I use pure graphite on this paper, I cover up most of the gray not always but yeah. most of the time uh, but i wanted to, to make a comment somebody said that it's past the sketch and become a drawing mm -hmm. um, and the way i like to think about the difference between a sketch and a drawing is that they're both hamburgers so stick with me here <laughs> um, you can go to a fast food restaurant and get a hamburger right and a lot of times that hamburger is delicious and fantastic not always but a lot of the times it is there's one like, I love Five Guys, you know, yeah. and um, it is not a fine dining establishment, mm -hmm. but they've got fantastic hamburgers, right? Yeah, they do. But you can go to one of those fine dining establishments and order a hamburger I for do $25. That. I do you that, know, that too. I go to fancy right. places, and I'm the only person at the table that gets a hamburger. I feel like <laughs> such a child. Right. Either way, both of those things are hamburgers. Just one is uh, at a fast food restaurant and one is at a more refined establishment. But you can enjoy them both. Exactly. So uh, the difference between a drawing and a sketch, a sketch, in my opinion, is still a drawing. It's just less formal. It's like, like a fast food hamburger where a drawing, if you want to call it a drawing, those were my uh, quotation marks, um, if, it's, if it's a little bit more formal, even though it may have a sketchy appearance, then it would be considered a drawing, much like the hamburger that we'd order at the uh, fine dining establishment. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, anything else before we switch over? I don't believe so. Fantastic sketch. Thank you for another great video tutorial. Uh, this is so good, Matt. Great work as always. So, Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. Drawing. I see your comments. They're popping up on my screen over there, which, is, which I have to turn my neck a lot to get to. <laughs> All right. Let's switch back out over here then. All right, everybody, thanks for sticking around for uh, this broadcast tonight. I hope you enjoyed it. I definitely enjoyed drawing this ear for you guys. I hope you picked up a couple of things that you can apply to your own artwork, of course, because that's what really this is all about. Uh, we want you guys to be the best artists that you possibly can be. And a very important part of that process of becoming a great artist is practice. And when we sketch, we are practicing. It's just like an athlete preparing for the big game. You have to work out, lift weights, do all that calisthenic stuff in preparation Training. for the game so that you can perform when it's time to do that. Same thing's true when we're creating sketches and things like this. This would be considered maybe a study of the year. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, hopefully you can apply what you've learned here to your own drawings and paintings. Uh, Ashley, have anything else to, to add? I've just been reading the comments a little bit. Uh, you guys are having fun with the parts of the ear, and uh, I also look, I had to look up and see what a fossa was myself. So I, too, am disappointed that my theme is not jungle theme so that I could draw a fossa next week. But uh, I like the idea of a jungle theme. So maybe mm, next, yeah. se next season I might leave the farm for the jungle. But until, um, until then, I'll be drawing next week. Not <laughs> sure what I'm going to draw next week, but uh, until I see you then, Hold on to your fossa triangularis. A wingo whack, a wingo whack. 
Uh, anyway, uh, I'd like to remind everybody, if you are a member, we are heading over to the virtualinstructor.com to continue on the painting. And I was going to show you guys the painting, and I forgot. Um, so maybe I'll hold it up. Let, let, you talk to Ashley for a minute. Okay, yeah, just hold it up next to yourself like you're real proud of it in art class, and I'm going to take a picture <laughs> of you and post it on our Twitter feed. Yeah. Here it is. So oh, far. it looks so oh, cute. It's kind of hard to see because there's, there's. Hold it still of, now. Hold it still. Bit, I'm trying to just line it up because everything's there backwards you go. here. Um, anyway, there's a color filter on the on the screen, so it makes the orange. The color's a little different. Bit, yeah, but uh, uh, more you intense. get the idea. It's a experimental, uh, relatively unusual composition, but it works. Yeah, it's and gotta, there, there's reasons why the composition works, even though it's unusual. Uh, and we talk about that. But but you should, if you're not going to be with us or weren't planning on it, you should sign up for a free membership in the next yep. 15 minutes and join yep. us. And maybe uh, you'll learn a little bit about Matt's unusual composition in yep. the next hour. Free for a week. Free for seven days. So. Free for seven days. Um, all right, guys. Uh, thanks for joining us. Remember, uh, make sure that you subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so yet. If you want to watch more awesomeness like this. And uh, also, uh, like this video if you enjoyed it. Make sure you like it. That will help other people discover the channel. Apparently that works from what I hear. So uh, you give us a thumbs up. That will be much appreciated. Yeah, people don't believe us. They'll believe you. And that's the, we can tell we can tell them that it's great, that it's the greatest show on YouTube, but they're gonna, you know, they're gonna respect your thumbs up and your subscribes more than that. <laughs> right. Absolutely. All right, guys, uh, stay safe and healthy, and uh, we'll see you right here next week. Good night, everybody.